Good morning and welcome. Thank you for coming this morning in such large numbers and this is a great turnout for the first event of the Aspen Institute India, a launch event for in Kolkata. Uh, we have been uh, operating in Delhi since 2004 when CII and the Aspen Institute of USA signed a memorandum of understanding and uh, it's great to be able to have the first chapter starting in Kolkata. And to have with us His Excellency the Governor of West Bengal, Mr. M. K. Narayanan, who has been in one essential part of our work, that is the track to strategic dialogues, uh, which we have had uh, with several countries. We started with the U.S. and there is someone sitting here who has come with the Governor, Dr. Ashley Jennings, who has been also deeply involved in that process with us, but from the other side, from the U.S. side. But he was there, sir, at the birth of this track to strategic dialogue because he had been punished and sent to Delhi on posting from, from Washington DC. And uh, so it's great to have the governor here. He has had enormous amount of time and interest in this work on, on track to dialogue. He's always given time and attention to visiting delegations, uh, encourage the Indian side. And uh, so we've been able to go on from the US to Singapore, to Japan, and more recently, our first round with China in Beijing, with the China, the, the party school of China, which is a different kind of an institution, not the usual think tanks of, of, of China. So, here we are in Calcutta. We hope to have regular events here, uh, policy programs, leadership uh, seminars, um, sessions on issues of topical interest. And we thought that today we would start with His Excellency because of his deep involvement over the last several years on foreign policy issues with India's engagement with the world. We thought that this would be a subject which uh, would come straight from the shoulder. I'm not sure about the heart, but uh, from him because he has lived this uh, whole issue over, over several years as the National Security Advisor uh, with the Prime Minister of India. So we are also very happy because it is in the tradition of Aspen to have some dialogue, to have Mrs. Krishna Bose here. She, is the chair, she was the chairperson of the Ministry of External Affairs Standing Committee. So I have worked with her for many years in the area of uh, foreign policy, India's engagement with the world. Uh, we have traveled together. She has led delegations of members of parliament where I have been uh, as a non-parliamentarian uh, part of the team uh, supporting her. So it's great to have her here with us to, to maybe respond and to question uh, the governor and participate in the conversation as we go forward. We have uh, taken 10 years to, to set up Aspen India. We first went to Aspen, in, Aspen USA in 1994. Uh, it took them 10 years to agree to set up Aspen India as an independent entity. We signed an agreement with them to, for the use of their name and for the use of their methodology. And it was the same year that I know that the Aspen USA people had met our then Foreign Secretary, Mr. Chris Srinivasan, also talking about uh, setting up Aspen in India. But after doing programs in India, the actual institution was established in 2004. And we have been doing programs around the country, but this is the first in Kolkata. Uh, one reason for that, apart from the fact that it's my hometown, is that we now have staff in Kolkata. And this young lady who is standing here in the green sari, Vito Sri Ghosh, is our Aspen flag bearer in, in, in Kolkata now. So we'll be able to have arms and legs to actually do stuff uh, in this part of the country. Uh, I don't think that we do enough on international issues here in, in the East, so this hopefully will fill a vacuum in, in, in this part of the country and we will seek the governor's uh, continued encouragement, guidance in also bringing speakers from other parts of the world to be here. He's been exposed to the Aspen Strategy Group who have met with him more than once. Uh, he has spent a lot of time interacting and explaining India's policies. 
So it's terrific that we have him here in Kolkata and Aspen will keep looking at him for his guidance and for his leadership. I'm going to stop now and I'm going to give the floor to the governor to speak on India's engagement with the world and I hope you enjoy this session and thank you again for coming. His Excellency the Governor. and members of this distinguished audience. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to launch the Kolkata chapter of the Aspen Institute and thank you also for that great introduction. Mr. Tarun Das has a reputation of being sometimes elastic with the truth <laughs> and I think this is one of those occasions. But I'm glad, I'm usually accustomed to being criticized, so getting some nice words said about me is always useful. I'm also delighted to speak on the subject of India's engagement with the world. But I dare say the subject is vast, and I hope you will agree that it's, <coughs> it's not possible to do proper justice to it in a short span of 30 minutes, which I believe is the time allotted to me. I'll try my best, but I think some of, uh, some of the inadequacies can be made up when <coughs> Sri Nidhi Krishna goes interrogates me <coughs> or has a question and answer session with me. Let me start with a, with a couple of preambular remarks this, uh, this morning. I want to say that it is not my intention <coughs> to either refer to or refute the many criticisms that are leveled at our lack of interest or our lack of engagement with the rest of the world. No doubt, we all agree that our institutions need to keep evolving and I, I would like to say that they are doing so, but there is always scope for improvement. But I think to this very learned and distinguished audience, I wish to make one point because I think it's fundamental. I think it's the core aspect of how we view our engagement with the world. Our engagement with the world is shaped by certain basic values apart from our history and geography. From the very beginning, we have tried to ensure that our engagement with the world meets certain basic tests. The test being that it fosters the development of our country and ensures a secure environment for its people. So when people say that we have not done this and we have not done that, they fail to realize that there are some fundamental core as aspects that a country has to keep in mind. Also, one of the most distinguishing factors of or aspects of our foreign policy or our external engagement has been the consensus that we have had for the last 60 and odd years. I mean, it's amazing that while we have a lot of what I would say, uh, toing and froing about our internal policies, the one area where I think, irrespective of whichever government is in power, whichever area of, of interest are being uh, talked about, we have had the widest national consensus. So, we believe that in dictating our engagement with the rest of the world, ensuring and maintaining this national consensus is fundamental. And that I think should never be lost sight of. And those who criticize the government for its policy, I sometimes say, ah, I think I'm no longer part of the foreign policy establishment, but nevertheless, I was an active member till recently. <coughs> I think it's important to recognize this. But I dare say, and I think many of the people who are present here, I don't know whether uh, all of them are, have been part and parcel of this setup or not, but I don't think this, our degree of our engagement has limited 
our state and 28 years have witnessed a tremendous consolidation of the relationship after a period of withering during the Yeltsin and, and other years. We, we have institutionalized now uh, a system of annual summits of heads of government. Our steady cooperation has attained heights which were almost unheard of previously. In the area of defense cooperation, Russia has always been a principal defense supplier, but we are now closely associated with Russia with regard to several of our new flagship programs. We have the fifth generation fighter, the nuclear submarine program, the cruise missile program, and the Goroshkov aircraft carrier issue, etc. That's the name of your thing. More importantly, Indian and Russian scientists are now working very closely on several areas of, I would say, physics and, and I would say the higher reaches of science and space cooperation. So, in the case of Russia, there are no blips on the sea, on the radar screen, so to say. Our relations are excellent, they are improving, and the change of leadership from Putin to Medvedev has not brought about any basic alteration in the trajectory of our relationship. I now come to the, our relations with the European Union. With the European Union, I dare say that our relations have prospered over the years. We now have a strategic partnership with the European Union itself. Apart from that, we have strategic partnerships with each of the individual, most of the individual countries of the European Union, such as the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and Germany. The European Union was still recently a largest trading partner, but China has overtaken the EU. It's now the second largest sector. And but given the economic prowess of the European Union, I think this is going to be one of the this the economic relationship is going to be one of the strongest anchors now in our relations. We have now institutionalized at the summit level the the, the the discussion between the leaders on both sides. And this is true not only of the European Union, but also with each of the countries. We have now an extensive degree of engagement in the area of energy, science and technology, and culture. Even with the Nordic countries of Europe, for instance, we have deepened relations over the past decades on issues such as financial services, trade and investment, as well as energy matters, including geothermal and non-conventional sources of energy, which is the Nordic and Iceland. Separately, our relations with France, Germany, and the UK, I would say, have vastly expanded in the past few years. High-level exchanges are now, I would say, and almost every other week, we have leaders coming and going. Provision exists for annual summits. Energy, science, and technology, and culture those are the main items, but in the case of France and the UK, civil nuclear strategic and defense cooperation figure very prominently. So you have the entire package. Within this first concentric circle, I think one of the most significant engagements today is with Japan. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, India and Japan have a strategic and global partnership. But more importantly, every single Prime Minister since Prime Minister Kozumi has pursued close relations with India, irrespective of their, their differences in various matters. The relationship has been clearly matured over the years and holds great promise for the future. Last December, visit to India of uh, Prime Minister Hatayama, I would like to mention, was a dramatic this is remarkable. I mean, he, had, he, was in, he, has been, he was in his seat only for, I think, a few months by then. But I think the number of items that were finalized, particularly with regard to some of the economic aspects, like the great <coughs> corridor, the Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor, and several other subjects, clearly reflected the, the depth of the relationship and where we are in our relations with the Japan.
the next concentric circle I would like to think concern our relations with our neighbors. Our two biggest neighbors are obvious, China and Pakistan. With one we have had a troubled relationship in the past and with the other had an endemic hostility prevents any significant improvement in, in relations. When I say this, I'm Pakistan, it's well known that I've been a hawk in all matters related to Pakistan, so you don't have to pardon me for using such strong language. I think both India and China today perceive that it is in their interest to strengthen the engagement between the two countries. Both countries have hence been following a policy of constructive engagement. As I mentioned, China is already India's biggest trading partner and I think bilateral trade is approaching almost 60 billion US dollars. Over the past few years, we have arrived at a number of agreements. In 2005, India and China established a strategic and cooperative partnership for peace and prosperity. In the year 2007, we drew up a 10-point roadmap to enhance the strategic partnership. In, in January 2008, the Prime Ministers of India and China signed a landmark document, Shared Vision for the 21st Century, signed in Beijing. But more importantly, at each one of the meetings, in the period when I was a National Security Advisor, I think there were at least 12 or 13 important meetings between our Prime Minister and either Prime President who is now or Premier Mitchell. And despite the fact that you have to tell it's possible that there's a lot of hyphen in what is said or not, I think what came through fairly clearly was that the leaders on both sides, we have no doubt about the Indian one of course, but even on the Chinese side, was the determination to build a close relationship and act in concert to meet global challenges. There are differences, of course, when two, two, uh, two of our large countries uh, are sort of emerging on the global scene, there will be differences in perception. But there has been a great deal of what I would say congruence of purpose, particularly in multilateral fora such as G20. And we saw a dramatic example of this at the Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen in December last year. But as in the case of the United States, I think there is reason to pause and think as to how our relations with China will proceed and where are we today. I think the most important thing is, and I think most people recognize it, that increased levels of engagement or not, we will have to adopt a very sophisticated approach in our dealings with China. It's no secret that China pursues its interests relentlessly. Today we also have a very assertive China. This is a China which is really obsessed with becoming, or I would say, not only obsessed with becoming the world's leading economic power by 2025, it's also keen to expand into many new areas, territorially and otherwise. Some of the areas, like the Indian Ocean, Northwestern Afghanistan, and countries on India's periphery, do a good cause of concerns for India, and that's where the possibility of a conflict of interest would take place. Now, quite clearly, does not need to, a conflict of interest does not necessarily lead to a conflict, but we need sophisticated means of dealing with that, with that situation. When you consider that militarily, China is now a real force to reckon with. And the fact that much of the activity is taking place around us, the Tibetan plateau, and in areas close to our border, we need to, as I said, pause and think what is the kind of relationship we need to have with China and how do we manage that relationship. I think we have of course, certainly moved away from what is what's generally known as the binary approach, I mean, yes or no kind of approach in our dealings with China. 
we have moved to the stage of what we call trust but verify. And I wonder, in the course of today's discussion, it might be worthwhile to see, do we need to go beyond this and see how do we approach this, the issue of our relations with China. With Pakistan, I think it's much easier. I think the relationship is in some ways going nowhere. And we did have hopes during the Musharraf years. Maybe some of us, I myself, were taken in by what we thought was a stall in the relations. But we did certainly see a reduction in the degree of hostility in, in, uh, between Pakistan and India. But all that has changed. I mean, about a week ago, I was speaking to another audience, but I think I mentioned that the advent of Demokhiani has brought the stall. There has been an enhancement of intra regional trade, investment, and people to people interaction. But I agree that SARC is a long way from becoming the kind of regional economic arrangement that would lead to the expansion of multi sexual links. But I want to tell members of this audience that but SARC hasn't been what it should be. Outside SARC, India has attempted to do what it possibly could in these circumstances. And given our focus on stability in our immediate neighborhood, we have tried to meet the individual requirements of Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives, and Bangladesh. Outside SARC, the SARC arrangements were the same. We have also gone ahead and tried to strengthen the matrix of relationships in East, Southeast, and East Asia in terms of our economic engagements. The institutional linkages with regional institutions of East and Southeast Asia have been not only really been established, but they have been strengthened. So, much of it is based on the mutuality of interest. We are an active participant in ASEAN and the India East Asia Summit. We have despite a great deal of opposition within the country, we entered into a free trade agreement with uh, ASEAN. A further expansion or upgrading of relationships with countries of Southeast and East Asia is also under, underway. Next, so our next circle of engagement is with Africa and Latin America. I think our efforts with Africa have paid off extremely well. There's a lot of criticism saying that compared to in China, India is, is, a, is a small player on the, on the African continent. <coughs> it was my good fortune to visit many countries of South Africa. But I dare say many of you have been there. My impression is that we have made an indelible impact on the mind of thinking of Africa. And in this, we have one fundamental strength which China will not have and will never have. Sunshine. And right across the African continent, the presence of, of Mahatma Gandhi is felt in every local corner. Many leaders, African leaders, quote from Gandhi. And I must say to my eternal shame, when they come to you and, and, and and tell you think, oh, well, you must be knowing this. I have to confess that I have to make you know. So I think we, we have we have something which the country that people see think that we are competing with, maybe China, doesn't have. Yes, they have deeper pockets, but I think we have made a very major dent in Africa. And we have several visits. The complaints are that we have left that we don't visit Africa as much as African leaders uh, come here. Chinese leaders go more often. But let me tell you, I think it, this is not. And I think one of the, the centerpiece of our African strategy, the reason, because I think the, the sort of love with Africa has been going on for a long time. But I think in early 2008, we hosted the first ever India Africa Forum Summit, which was a, which was a conspicuous success and has led to an extensive interface with almost the entire African continent. The daily declaration is quoted from time to time. The newspapers and others keep referring to it in Africa. 
And there was also another document, the Africa-India Framework for Cooperation, which outlined the kind of blueprint of India-Africa engagement in the 21st century. With Latin America, of course, we are in a, not on the, on the same uh, level, for instance. The sort of hottest link that we have is with Brazil. Earlier, we used to have in Cuba, but I think Cuba is a different view today. But Brazil has now become a very major source of, of strength for us as far as the Latin American continent is concerned. We have several levels of engagement with, with Brazil, primarily with, of course, bilateral at one level in um, the IFSA, India, Brazil, South Africa, with BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and the Lord. But the subjects also cover a very wide range science and technology, of course, agriculture and defense, nuclear, space, etc. To a lesser extent, I think. Brazil overshadows our relationship with some of the other countries like Argentina and others. But I dare say that there is scope for greater involvement in Latin America, and that's an area where we should and need to emphasize our strengths. Before I end, I cannot but mention where we stand on, on nuclear disarmament. And I hope Mr. Ashley Tennis, who is one of the main strategic thinkers on the subject, would, would not contradict what I'm going to say. There is here also criticism that where does India stand on the issue of nuclear disarmament? I would like to say that, that our non participation in the non proliferation uh, the NPT conference that is taking place in New York at the moment may give an impression that we are not part of the nuclear non proliferation mainstream. I think this projection would be totally mis misleading. For years, India has been a leading member of the international consensus on non proliferation. We are unique in the sense that we have an international moratorium on nuclear explosive testing after having carried out tests. We adhere strictly to nuclear non proliferation norms and exercise strict control on nuclear equipment, material, and technology. We are committed to universal, non discriminatory, and comprehensive nuclear disarmament. I do not know whether I should repeat. In 1988, Rajiv Gandhi unveiled an action plan in the, in the United Nations, which in, which in some ways has not been overtaken by subsequent events. The features of the plan were a commitment by all nations to eliminate nuclear weapons in stages by the year 2010. Had anybody taken, or have at least a nuclear weapon bars taken adequate care? with adequate attention to what he has said, maybe we would have, that this would have been a world without nuclear weapons by this year. <coughs> the plan also talked in terms of all nuclear weapon states to participate in the process of nuclear disarmament and affect changes in their doctrine, policy and institution to sustain a world free of nuclear weapons. The most important point was he said, let's delegitimize nuclear weapons, some of which is now again coming up on the on the scene by various people. And he talked in terms of cessation of production of missile material and a time bomb elimination of nuclear stockpiles. Twice in this decade, in 2006 and 2008, variants of the same idea were put forward by our Prime Minister in the United Nations and in New York. I just wish to make the point unequivocally here that our position is very clear on the nuclear But I'm not too sure whether the nuclear hacks, particularly the United States and Russia, have exactly the same, same view. It is true that in Prague this year, in April, the United States and Russia, and Russia, or the US and Russian presidents, 
put their signatures to a, a renewed strategic arms reduction speed by which they agree to eliminate nuclear weapons by by a third. But almost immediately, Mr. Dennis will, I think we should ask him on this one. Almost immediately, the US has come up with what it says an advanced capability anti-missile system. This is an area where of course the United States has all the superiority over Russia or for that matter any other country. The Russians have already interpreted this as, as a development of new and advanced strategic missile defense system, which violates the spirit and letter of stars. Their own military doctrine has said that if any country engages in strategic missile defense, this would undermine anything in terms of global stability and destroy the balance of power in the nuclear missile sphere. I just try not drawing attention to this fact because in the past two to three years we have had a number of initiatives, the most important being the Global Zero Initiative, bringing down nuclear weapons to zero. I mean, there were four leading members of this group, led by Kissinger, Sam Nunn and others, popularly now referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they have been talking, I myself have been part of the part and part of this debate twice uh, in the last year and even earlier this year. But I think that debate is going nowhere. We have, and I just wish to make that point particularly, that we have perhaps the most consistent and clear position. And I think there is no element of double speak in what we are pretending. And we need to be proud of this position. But quite clearly, as far as the East is concerned, the, uh, the nature of the relationship is less high profile than what it is with the, with the West, and the very type of countries that we deal with. But I think you should look at the where we were, say, 10 or 15 years ago, and where, where we are today. I've made a very distinct point about, about Japan. I could continue to talk about Japan for a good half an hour. I think where Japan was and where Japan is today in terms of its engagement and its attitude towards India is I think an excellent uh, uh, benchmark as to where we, what are, has been the success of our Lutheran policy. And for that of course as I said, we starting from Prime Minister Mori and then going on to Kozumi and others we need to be there. Singapore is another country which I think and a lot of disdain for India. But I think Singapore has now become really the fulcrum around which much of our policy towards Southeast Asia and East Asia is developing. Indonesia is another country where I think they didn't have much use for India in the past other than the you know, long past where I think Indian influence and culture played a role. <coughs> but I think it's, it's one of the warmest relationships we have now. With Vietnam, of course, we had a relationship of a certain kind of going back um, uh, in the years, but I think now it's a really vibrant, vibrant one. <coughs> Malaysia has had its ups and downs. We need to strengthen our relationship with, with Malaysia. In terms of substance, as I said, you, you'll find there's a great deal happening. I didn't take on some of the other countries further. Take Australia, for instance. <coughs> I think uh, in the last four or five years, I think that Australia has been cultivating us literally in that sense of the term and I think we have responded in adequate uh, measure. But in, in, uh, in terms of what I would say public perception, the West has a much bigger, uh, I mean you are more familiar with the United Kingdom, you know about the United States, you are familiar with France, Germany, etc. But I think in, if you really take and once our economic arrangements fall into place and with ASEAN, East India, Asia, East Asia summits and others falling into place, I think these will in some ways perhaps eclipse it. One of the problems, it also depends to some extent where we stand with China. It's 
true that I think I did mention that it's become a largest trading partner, but it is in a sense our exports to China is almost limited to a single item. I think everybody is aware of what that is. So it's not as if it's, it's a very full blown uh, relationship in that sense of term. There's concern here about Chinese goods coming to India, cheaper Chinese goods coming to India. So there are there are um, pressures upon them. But the very fact is there is an engagement which is of, of a uh, nature and, and of a kind that is much, much more vital than what it was in the past. Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, that whatever we deliberated upon today was uh, tremendous learning. What I was thinking is uh, when we when we spoke about engagement or when we think of engagement, what you mentioned is more or less what we talk as a top-down approach. That is uh, the president's, uh, the prime minister, the senior level of the people engaging. What I was thinking, that engagement also comes, the people engaging. And how can we make the people, the common people engage with each other? Now, one is sports. And we have found, in, from time to time, sports is a big engager. Well, maybe India is unfortunate that besides cricket or a few other games, it is, uh, uh, it is not so strong at sports, and, uh, but it has done a great bit wherever cricket is played, including Pakistan. The other is entertainment. So I was wondering that India has a tremendous entertainment infrastructure and potential, which we are using, we are having, and we in Bongo Shanshkuti, seeing the shiny media. We have had various programs, but uh, how much that is affected? So, basically my question is, sir, to you that uh, how can we engage more of our people? Because if the people engage more, then I think the perceptions change. Maybe it takes time. Lockdown is important. But that gets the thing moving and going. Economy is important, military is important. But the other side is which is time is potentially important. This is my question, sir. Well, I think <coughs> you answer it in the, the question, the answer in the question itself. Now, I think you can't force people in, in some ways to, to sort of interact with each other. It, we have probably a much better relationship in that respect with the with country to the West, probably because that we have no problems about language to the same extent. But I dare say that there, and, and if you notice, I think in almost every country today, culture is a very important one. But there is a bit of a, what I would say, mismatch. I think the average Indian, or at least the average cultured Indian, if I might use the term, enjoys Bollywood but looks down upon Bollywood. We must talk about, you must be a um, student of the Aurobindo philosophy, the Vivian Tech of I mean, uh, what do you call it? Classical music, classical dance, etc. Let me explain the situation. <coughs> we went to Japan in 2006, 2007, I forget, when uh, Prime Minister Abe was the uh, Prime Minister of Japan. And uh, as part of, of the group that we, uh, I mean, the group that we had, took a, took a troop. One from the uh, ICCI, Indian Council of Conservation, and the other one was Shamik Nawal. Fortunately, Mr. Xavier and the Prime Minister's office was not appeared, or that Shamik Nawal's group was there. But we, 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 went, uh, we went there, and there was a very nice cultural performance produced by the Indian Council of Conservation, and the crowd went to sleep. So we did not understand it. I mean, uh, and Shavat Dawar and company came on the plan and just electrified the audience. But the Prime Minister, and it was my misfortune to be sitting next to Mrs. Busher and Carl, and she sort of turned around and said, What are you doing? What, how did this happen? Because there were these cantilly climbing, <laughs> climbing on top of poles and coming. So we tried to, we tried to flee. But Prime Minister Abe refused to leave. He was enjoying this thing, 
there's two that are going to be written. So, you know, the point is, there is, there is enough point, what do, what do we need? We went, uh, we went to the uh, India EU summit, uh, also brought about 2005 to 2006 or something, to Finland, Helsinki. And we went into some of the uh, shops to I mean, buy some books or buy something else, and there was Bollywood music coming. coming. So I agree that there is a great deal that you know, but we, we find it difficult to export it in there. You have to, uh, it has to be done by, uh, partly by the people themselves, partly by the agencies. Now the agencies find it difficult, find it, uh, find it it's rather difficult for them to be so, so pursuing some of the songs that are popular in India and which are popular across the world. In Hindi pop I think is now the most popular culture across the world. So we need to reconcile that. In our sense, the cultural uh, invasion that we are interested in talking about is something which I think the rest of the world isn't fully prepared, prepared for, namely high class, high quality classical music. Yes, there is a, there is a consistency for that, but we are looking, talking about across the world, you require that. I agree that once, once you have established the top-down approach, you need freer movement of people and freer movement of action. But I think that, that is happening. I mean, I think one of our best ambassadors in this country is uh, you go to Japan again. Sai Baba is, a, is such a major factor. There are many parts of Africa also where. So I think there, there are a lot of things taking place. They don't get uh, portrayed in the fashion that, uh, that one would uh, like. But speaking from this platform of the pulpit, I can talk basically about government policy rather than the rest of it. <laughs> We have another distinguished uh, person in the audience here, Professor Shugata Bose from Harvard, who is a regular at Aspen program. Shugata, you have a question for the governor? Um, well, thank you very much, first of all, for a sweeping magisterial survey of uh, India's engagement with the world. Uh, I have two questions, somewhat disparate. First is, isn't there an element of bureaucratic inertia that hampers our engagement with the world? Let me give a quick example. My Mother, Mrs. Krishna Bose, writes in her book that she received many parliamentary delegations from the European Union with which India was trying to build a strong relationship. And they repeatedly invited a parliamentary delegation to make a return visit so that the relationship became multi stranded. It would not just be the executive branch of the government interacting, but was never quite able to persuade her dear friends in the Ministry of External Affairs to manage to achieve that. So, uh, uh, could there be a little bit more of um, initiative, uh, not activism, but initiative? The second question is uh, really about wanting to understand a little bit better as perhaps been seen sometimes as a doubt. I think today in the world, through India's engagement in the world, with which you, sir, have been involved for the last six years closely, <coughs> I think we have respect of the world. I see this everywhere. A large part of my time, when you complain that I'm never available in Delhi because I'm traveling, uh, some of my friends in the audience here are also complain like that. <laughs> but uh, there is respect for India. And I think that is a reflection of a successful foreign policy and successful engagement in the world. And I think we should continue to be conservative, we should continue to be cautious. But this is not about risk taking. By the way, this has not been mentioned, but the economic benefits have been enormous for the private sector, for business. India's engagement with the world has been just unbelievable. And that's why you see that in this year alone, in the first few months, we have over $15 billion of investments going out from India, from private sector. And by the end, it will be 30 billion. So we are not only a force to reckon with on the political and other side, strategic side, but also now I think on the economic side. And I think this is again a, a success of the India's engagement with the world. Um, finally, sir, it's a privilege to have you. I hope you will be with us again in the future. And with your permission, now to we get a final edited copy of this speech, We'd like to publish it and make it very widely known throughout the world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in applauding our Chief Guest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.